that it would be a really valuable piece of property, kind of intellectual property, sort of, that the location of the tunnel, in a way, and so that that would be something that would be really important and that it would be something we could use in the book as something people are chasing after. It also kind of serves thematically, right? It's a metaphor to, you know, going underground and needing to hide things. I think in the book, one of the characters kind of has a realization that this is where worlds collide with one another is through tunnels. And there are tunnels from various milieu and environments that intersect with one another and that you don't really know what's going on underground. And that kind of realization he has about the worlds that he moves in maybe obvious in a way, but I really liked it once we realized we were going to have tunnels in the book. I was like, oh, this is thematically interesting as well. I thought that the book itself was, you had a tunnel, then you had a room. The guy was held up in the room and, you know, there was a lot of the book. And with Diane, I thought it was kind of interesting how that tunnel was her downfall as far as if anybody found out she knew about the tunnel, she was going to be in more danger. It's a world where knowing the truth, you get killed. And secrets are almost a matter of self-preservation. Literally, I guess they are. To have to carry around stuff like that as part of your job, right? There were so many situations in the book that I was like, how the heck is she going to get out of this <laughs> Definitely. That's good to hear. That's a writer's number one job is to make the reader think the character's not going to get out of this. And then poor Bronwyn. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He was kind of creepy. If you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they just weren't right for each other. He's happily married and he's doing fine now. Don't worry about oh, it. Okay. That's oh, good. Good. Yeah, that's good. So I'm curious, did either one of you ever watch the show Weeds? Yeah, I watched it. Okay, because it just made me think of that show. <laughs> yeah, that's a great show. It's funny. It's like a more humorous version of this world, obviously, in the DA, But she does kind of get sucked into bigger and badder things than she thinks she will. You kind of have two choices. You can be a workaday person, but you know, goes by the rules. Maybe you feel, you see other people cutting corners or doing things that are illegal and getting ahead. And you think, oh, maybe I should do that. But if you go the other route and you, you do go for the quick buck, you discover that the costs are incredibly high. The consequences of messing up in those worlds can be devastating. I think that's, to me, like a fascinating choice when a character decides to go for the thing that she wants to make a difference and she wants to be efficacious in the world. She wants her life to have kind of meant something, right? So she's doing things that are questionable and risky. And I think those characters that are motivated in that way are super fascinating. And that's the case in Weeds, right? Well, I absolutely loved the fact that you included horse racing in this book, and I think it gave us a little view into Diane's personality. If I was a betting woman, I'd say one of you enjoys betting on the ponies because there was a lot of information <laughs> in there. <laughs> I did a picture of the two of us at the track, actually, when we were working on the book. We weren't sitting there typing it. Truthfully, I did go to Santa Anita Racetrack in Los Angeles quite a bit, sit and take a laptop, you know, and get a cup of coffee and put on a race and write a little bit. And that section you're referring to it, a bunch of those sentences came out of observations just sitting there at the track. I grew up on horses up here in Montana. You know, the Western Montana Fair would have horse racing every year. You'd go, like, her father is someone who took her to the track in the book. When I was like five or six, I remember riding on my dad's shoulders as he went and bet on a couple of ponies. I'd ride on his shoulders into the, <laughs> into the beer garden. <laughs> I have a beer and wait for his race to start. I like that memory. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It's sort of illicit, right? It's sort of like you get to go, you, you kind of tell there's money involved and you probably shouldn't be risking it and it's kind of naughty or whatever. And, uh, when you're a kid exposed to that, it's kind of first view of the adults sitting. <laughs> That's funny. So how'd you do on the days you sat around the racetrack and bet a little bit? I'm okay. Is it the coin? Uh, no, you box them. So you pick, oh, the, okay. pick two you pick two that you think are gonna definitely be in the top three and then you pick a long shot. Is that the trifecta? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think the trifecta is you have to get them right, like in each order, like yeah. first time, third. And this, you just pick three and it can be in any order. But you throw that long shot in there and the payouts can be pretty good. I've done all right doing that. 
a lot of times just going like, well, I like this horse named Molly's Gambit. I think I'll take that one. <laughs> I think we both ended up ahead. We spent like eight hours there, maybe even longer, mm -hmm. uh, the whole day. And I think we both ended up ahead. But Smith is a professional gambler. So, you know, he has an advantage in these situations for sure. <laughs> well, regardless, we love this book. It had humor, action, little romance in there. It was a good story. Well, so, thank you so much. That's yeah, great to hear. Fun. We love hearing that. Are you working on any new books now? Individually and together. Right now, we're the next book in this series. We're kind of thinking it's in total is going to be three, maybe four books. You know, I don't know. Once you get in there, you start to see the scope of the thing and it sort of changes. I'm always writing something and it might not be what I think it is. It's like it might be a short story and then it turns out to be a screenplay or it's a screenplay and it turns out to be a novel. I think I'm in that situation right now. He has this fantastic book that he never published that we made into a feature film when I was at the University of Texas. We adapted into a feature film using some of the elements and I know that he's been polishing that off and what else are you doing? I've got a teleplay. I'm working on that book. I'm tweaking it trying to finish it up, a pilot, basically. And that's enough for now, I guess, three things. <laughs> when you decide on the new Diane book, please let us know so we can... Be the first to read it. <laughs> yeah, and, oh, and we will. get it on the show. <laughs> we will, for sure. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Do you have a website where people can find your books? My website is smith-henderson.com. Um, where you can learn more about the other book and other projects I'm working on. Order stuff online from Powell's or book people. But please find a local person to order it from if you can. A lot of relationships with these places and people work there. They tell you, well, if you like this, you'll love this. And it's that old school. Everything's fed to us by the algorithm on Netflix and Amazon and stuff. And it's just really nice to go talk to a real person, not just because of the human interaction, but because there's stuff that's not in the algorithm. It's just like the person who works there, is, it's just like their favorite book, and they're like, you have to read this. It wouldn't be on any list. That's what's important to me. We've found a lot of authors since we've started this podcast that we probably wouldn't have picked up. Talking to other writers. and Right. And writers, so, yes. and independent booksellers. John, Mark, do you have a website? No, I have a Twitter page, so if you just look up John Mark Smith on Twitter, you can find me. Great. Okay, well, I guess that wraps everything up. Thank you all for the great questions and the great conversation. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day, one cold and one not so cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we balance it out. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Well, I really liked this book. It was a little bit of everything. The first half of the book was a little slow, but once she got to Mexico, boom, that book took off. Yeah, just Diane as a character, she was very well fleshed out, and I feel a lot of her reactions are things that I would have reacted to. Like the whole Bronwyn situation, like Kathy said, he was a little creepy. I think I would have been like, mm, you're a nice guy, but <laughs> you need to move on. But having said that, she did kind of leave him in the middle of Minnesota. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and took off. So well, they're he's both a little. Wood. <laughs> yeah. So they're both a little odd. Well, the way the book opens up is really that was not slow in any no. stretch of the imagination and i think that that was probably the creepiest thing about him because i think most guys would have been like eh, i'm out of here <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. yeah but she goes off on her own without direction from the dea she heads for mexico just one little note well, gonna... she did have some direction, but it wasn't the direction that she should have taken. <laughs> well, she told her partner, at least. He knew what was going on, so it wasn't like she took off without anybody knowing what was going on. If you want a kick-ass, take-charge 
female protagonist you find it in Diane. But I'm really glad that we came across this series and that it was the first in the series because we really got to know Diane very well. And I'm so looking forward to see what direction, especially since they kind of gave a little hint that she's going to go off to some pretty exotic, exciting areas. So we'll get to see where that leads. Another recommended book by awesome. your dark and stormy <laughs> book reviewers. <laughs> and I do want to add something else. Even though this deals with the topic of drugs, it's not the kind of book that's going to trigger anything. No. There's there's no. nothing in there. It's just more about the distribution of drugs and the fight of trying to put a stop to that. Yeah, there's nothing in there that's going to no, no. create. My new and noteworthy book for this week is Every Little Secret by A.R. Torre. It came out December 1st by Thomas N. Mercer. Welcome to the neighborhood. Watch your husband, watch your friends, and watch your back. My new and noteworthy book is Requiem for a Female Serial Killer by Phyllis Chesler. It came out November 12th, published by New English Review Press. This book will challenge everything you ever thought about prostitutes, serial killers, and justice in America. My new and noteworthy is The Last Resort. It is by Susan Holliday, and it came out December 1st by Thomas and Mercer Books. When Amelia is invited to an all-expense-paid retreat on a private island, the mysterious offer is too good to refuse. Along with six other strangers, she's told they're here to test a brand new product for Time O Technologies. But the guest's excitement soon turns to terror when the real reason for their summons becomes clear. Trivia! Last week's question was, Almost everyone is familiar with with Ann Perry's conviction in 1954 for the murder of her best friend's mother. But what was her occupation after she was released? A. Secretary, B. File Clerk, C. Stewardess, or D. An Editor? The answer is C. After her release in 1959, Ann moved to England and changed her name. She became a stewardess, and she worked there until she moved to the U.S. in 1979. This week's question is, which famous author wrote books on ancient Egypt that have been in continual print since their first release in the 1960s? A. Agatha Christie B. Michael Pierce, C. Linda Robinson, or D. Elizabeth Peters. Good luck. Be sure and visit our website, darkstormybc.com, where you can check out all of our episodes. You can sign up for our newsletter. Click on the Patreon page and help us out a bit. Email us any reviews, ideas. And you know what else we haven't said in a while? Liking us on iTunes and downloading really, really helps us. Gets our train down the track. Exactly. So like us, give us five stars. Please. Oh, please, <laughs> yeah. We like five stars. I hope you'll join us next week. But remember, life would be boring without a little mystery. Bye. Bye.